Thanks everyone for being here today. My name is Eva Zaret. I'm a public health specialist at Central Vermont Medical Center and the coordinator of the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition. You are at uh, the fourth in a series of community forums on drugs and alcohol that the coalition is holding across Central Vermont. It's actually our last one of sort of the season and then we'll pick up the forums again um, in the fall and make sure that we hit all of the towns that are in Central Vermont. And I have to say that out of every forum, something really interesting has happened. We've been able to help stand up um, after school programming for kids, create new uh, education programming for parents and caregivers, um, support schools in screening and thinking about safety in terms of prom and uh, graduation. So everywhere we go, something comes out of these forums, which has been really pretty remarkable. Um, like I said, there's a sign-in sheet. Uh, we'd love your contact information. Um, and if you're on Zoom, you can drop your information into the chat um, if you'd like to be kept informed. Um, there's a few housekeeping things that we'd like to do for Zoom land. I'm like turning that way, but I should turn this way. <laughs> um, please, if you've gotten through the pandemic so far without having to do all of this, congratulations. Um, but what we would like is for you to please stay on mute unless you're speaking. Um, the chat box is gonna be monitored by Olivia so you can put comments and um, questions and feedback in the chat. We have a Q&A session planned, but if you have a burning question in the moment or you didn't hear something, please let us know. You can raise your Zoom hand by uh, pressing on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'd love to see your faces, but there's no obligation to keep your camera on. Okay, we had a little tech, uh, we had a Wi-Fi issue on this end, which I think if you live in Vermont, you're used to that. Um, so thanks for bearing with us and hopefully it won't happen again. Um, and everyone can still hear me in Zoom world? Good, thumbs up. Okay, great. So the last thing I said was we'd love to see your faces, but there's no obligation. Again, completely understanding that bandwidth issues are a real thing in Vermont. Um, we are going to be sharing a lot of resources with you tonight, um, and so we want to make sure that you leave with what you need. Are there printouts over there, Olivia? So on that table are also printouts of all of the resources that you'll be hearing about tonight. If you're on Zoom, we will be dropping um, resources into the chat for you, or you can take a screenshot or a picture of what you're seeing on the screen to make sure that you have the information that you need. Um, Lastly, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that there are likely folks here who have been impacted uh, by drug and alcohol use, whether it's their own experience or that of a loved one. Um, and there are possibly people here tonight who have lost somebody to, um, to an overdose. And so we ask that you keep these things in mind tonight um, when you're asking uh, questions and making comments. And we just want to say how grateful we are for everybody um, to everybody for being here tonight in the room. Um, I'm just gonna take a minute to show you the agenda for the evening. So we're gonna do a quick poll, then we're gonna do an overview of drug and alcohol use in um, Vermont. We're gonna talk about resources that are available in central Vermont, and you'll hear from panelists who are both in the room and on Zoom. We'll talk a little bit about drug and alcohol prevention and some ideas for preventing use in youth. Um, then we'll get to the open forum part of the evening uh, and we'll have a final poll and then um, that will be the event. All right, so I'm going to have Olivia launch our poll now. So if you're in person, these are the first few surveys that are on paper. If you're on Zoom, we would love for you to take the poll that should be launching. So these first questions are um, titled federal questions. These are questions that we have to ask because we receive federal funding. Um, I apologize that they don't offer completely inclusive options, um, but please answer as you are able and comfortable. Olivia, will you give me like a 10 second countdown or something? Yeah. Yeah, we can do like 10 more seconds. Okay, 
So just a couple more seconds. And okay, we're gonna go ahead and close that poll. All right, and then I believe we have another. So this is our question, this is our poll about who's in the room tonight. So we asked the federal questions that are demographic questions. These are really about who, um, who's here this evening, what town are you from, how would you define your role um, in the community and the final question is, how did, you find out? Oh, how did you learn about tonight's event? That will just help us with our promotion. All right, a few more seconds for this one. Okay. All right, we're gonna close that one. And then we have one final poll, I promise, bear with us. This is only two questions. This is something that's gonna help us understand um, if we're able to convey the information properly that we're here to convey. Do you wanna share with yourself? Oh, go, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. So we can look at, so we have some folks here from Waitsfield, Duxbury, at least on Zoom. Um, we have some from out of the area, which is great, and we're glad that you're here. Um, I'm having you scroll on the screen, but I can say um, we have some elected officials, some impacted um, by drugs and alcohol, and some who work in this field. Um, and it looks like people came here from all different sorts of promotions, so that's awesome. Great, okay, so let's do the final one. So this final one is just two questions, like I said, and this just helps us understand if we're getting the information across that we want to. So the first question is, if someone I know was struggling with drugs or alcohol, I would know what resources to point them to for help. And you can strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. Um, and the second question is, there are actions I can take to make my community a healthier place for young people. And again, your options are strongly agree, agree, disagree, and strongly disagree. All right. Just the last few seconds, and good? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for taking these. These are really helpful for us for a variety of reasons. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna get into the first part. Um, So what we wanted to do was sort of step back and just sort of set the context of why we're here tonight. Um, and so we're gonna talk about drug and alcohol use among young people uh, for the entire state of Vermont. So among 18 to 25 year olds, Vermont as a state come uh, in 2019 from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health ranks first in illicit drug use in the past month for this age group, first for marijuana use in the past month and first for marijuana use in the past year. Third for cocaine use in the past year. Fourth for alcohol use in the past month. And fifth for binge alcohol use in the past month. So Vermont has really high substance use rates across all ranges, but in particular this age group uh, consistently year after year ranks um, very high in their use rates. Um, Next slide, Olivia. And it would be, we just really couldn't have tonight's forum if we weren't talking about uh, overdose deaths and the impact that the pandemic has had on overdose deaths. So what we see here is that from the year 
of March 19 until March 20, there were 114 fetal opioid related overdoses in Vermont. And March is right when the pandemic hit. And then March 20, the following year to, until March 2021, there were 211 fatal overdoses. That's an increase of 85%. And that's actually the fastest increase in the entire country out of all states. Um, and so this is why we're here tonight is because these are really concerning numbers um, and we as a substance use coalition um, with these amazing partners who are here tonight to talk to you feel like we have to come out into the community and uh, bring awareness to the resources that are available and hear from the community about what you need and what we can offer. Um, so that's what we'd like to do now is transition into what resources are available in central Vermont to help um, with these kinds of issues. So uh, first I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Mark Detman who's here in the room with us today to talk a little bit about the coalition and the role of the emergency department. You can talk right here and this one will pick you up. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Mark Detman. I'm an ER doctor. I've been doing this work for, <clears throat> I worked for 20, almost 25 years in an urban center and I've been here in Vermont for 15 years working in a rural community hospital. And um, substance use is a real focus of my work and frankly of my department's work. Um, if any of you know anybody who needs help in a crisis oh, around. Mark, they say that they can't. So. so our emergency department is open 24 seven and we're available to anybody who needs help with an alcohol or drug crisis. Um, we can initiate treatment. We can make hard connections at three in the morning with support staff um, who can help somebody navigate um, to recovery. Um, six years ago, our department didn't feel like we were doing a whole lot for people that came in in crisis. And we started exploring our neighborhood and finding out that there was a hub and spoke model that was just that had just started um, to help people with opioid use disorder and get them into treatment. Um, but we also found out we had a lot of neighbors in our greater Washington County area working in the fields of recovery, um, harm reduction, prevention. And then we started to meet people involved in the drug court and people involved in um, you know, trying to bring people when they come into the community from the correction system or wherever they might be coming from, help them in, initiate care in the, in the, in the new community. Um, and we began meeting all sorts of other partners and we, we all came together to form a coalition. And that was originally called the Washington County Substance Abuse Regional, what? Partnership. Partnership. <laughs> <laughs> and we finally decided a year and a half ago to shorten that. And we're now the um, Central Vermont Prevention Coalition. But it does include all those things we talked about. Primary prevention, which we're going to focus on a lot tonight, I hope. Um, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction. Um, but, you know, my passion really is getting out into the community and getting into the towns. There's so many little towns here where they really aren't touched by um, information and opportunities um, to make a difference. And what I really care about is changing the onset of substance use if possible in our communities. And that's a focus on 14 to 25 year olds. And I'll be really interested to see where we can find some discussion points this evening. So um, I'll leave it at that and put this down. Great, thank you, Mark. All right. Um, as I mentioned, I am Eva Zaret. I'm a public health specialist at CVMC, and we also have Olivia LeClaire here, who has done an excellent job organizing all of these forums and is serving with us as a community organizer through um, AmeriCorps this year. So we're sorry to see her go soon, um, but really thankful for all of her help. All right, next slide. So I'm going to pass it over to Martina Anderson from Vermont Cares, who is on Zoom. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for being here. And um, I'm so sorry. I was really uh, excited to be in person with everyone, but I'm so appreciative of this um, hybrid model. And um, I was joking with Eva because last time it went so smoothly and I was kind of jealous because I've tried to do hybrids <laughs> and they didn't go so well. Um, and so I was like, felt a little bit better that something went a little bit, um, you know, off today. <laughs> <laughs> but my name is uh, Martina Anderson, and I'm the harm reduction program manager at Vermont Cares. And Vermont Cares is an uh, AIDS uh, HIV service organization that started back in the 80s as a grassroots organization out of a living room, you know, of a couple of people who were really passionate uh, in Burlington uh, at the height of the AIDS epidemic. And so since then we have grown and into the harm reduction organization we are today and we have three uh, brick and mortar offices um, and the closest one to you all is in Barrie, Vermont. You can see here at 51 Church Street, we are co-located with the People's Health and Wellness Clinic. Um, we serve though uh, almost the whole state. So as I mentioned, we are the largest um, uh, syringe service program um, in Vermont. And so we serve actually through 11 counties. So we also have an office in St. Johnsbury and we have another one in Rutland, but then we also serve the rest of our communities um, via mobile vans. We have two mobile vans and our individual personal vehicles, of course. So what do we offer on the road uh, where we literally meet people where they're at? We take that quite seriously um, as well as in our brick and mortar locations. So um, as the name says, we offer, you know, a syringe service program it offers sterile syringes, but then lots of other things to other safer injection, safer smoking and safer snorting tools for people who are, you know, in active drug use and we want to keep them safe and whenever they are ready to take a different step, um, support them along that way, right? But we cannot recover. Um, I, I think Javid always said, you can't recover if you're six feet under. And so we really wanna ensure to, to not just meet, but accept people where they're at and, and offer them all the tools to keep them safer in the life. So we of course also have Narcan, um, which is an um, opioid antagonist medication. So if somebody is experiencing an accidental drug poisoning, this medication can be administered and the person um, can be brought back to, to life. We give that out to community members as well. Fentanyl test strips, of course, as an aid service organization, we offer HIV and hepatitis C um, screening tests. We also offer HIV case management um, and safer sharps disposal. So we teach everyone, we want, you know, community members to bring sharps back to us, but then also teach them how to safely dispose of them if that is not possible. And then to the wider community, we offer trainings. So we offer trainings around harm reduction and also opioid overdose prevention. Thanks, Eva. Go back to the previous slide. Just ask Martina to clarify how someone reaches them. Is that a Barry phone number? Or is that going to be from the statewide organization? Sure, Martina, can you talk a little bit about that phone number? Does that connect somebody with your Barry office or with <laughs> my uh, phone yours? <laughs> <laughs> so that is actually my phone number. And as the, the program manager, that's perfectly fine. And, you know, I can get you into the direction that you need, but I would be, um, you know, the, the, the best contact person for Washington County as I personally live actually in Washington County. But so that is a perfectly fine phone number. We also have a, a syringe service uh, program phone number. I'll be dropping in the chat momentarily where then people, you know, can choose the area that they, uh, that they want to be connected with. Um, and for the aid service uh, side of things, we also have like a, you know, a, a, just a Vermont Cares phone number. So I'll drop all of those in the chat in just a moment. But um, I mean, I'm really excited that you just pointed this out because maybe I should share that we're really excited that we are actually going to be launching a mobile app. And we've been saying this for like a long time, um, but um, we are going to um, fingers crossed, I'm probably going to jinx it right now, but we are hoping to launch it uh, June 1st. And so that will be like a super easy way to get in contact with us and even more anonymous than um, a phone number uh, would provide you to do so. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Evan Smith, who's in the room today. So Evan, come on up. Uh, yep, come on up and just sort of, this is your tiny microphone okay. that you're gonna speak into. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Evan Smith. I'm a licensed clinical social worker who works uh, at Central Vermont Medical Center. I'm the main manager of behavioral health services. Uh, one of my jobs there is to oversee uh, the spoke services uh, and the staffing of spokes for uh, opioid treatment here in central Vermont. So we have a team of seven folks who work on our MAT team, and we're embedded in uh, both private uh, substance abuse practices uh, throughout the uh, county, but also in primary care practices. Um, what I want to say to you guys today uh, is, first and foremost, for those folks who are struggling with substance use issues, help is available. Um, there, it, you can get access to treatment for substance abuse uh, relatively easily uh, without significant barriers to getting into treatment. Um, we can't necessarily say that that is the case for mental health services. We know about the crisis going on in terms of accessing psychiatry and psychiatric beds, but um, getting access and getting into intensive outpatient programs or into residential care it's something that people can get into and you can get into outpatient services or into MAT services uh, relatively easily. Locally, uh, the number, if, if you do need to get into or are interested in learning more about opioid care services, is the number on the screen there at Central Vermont Medical Center. That is the MAT line uh, for medication-assisted treatment. Uh, any of our staff will be uh, uh, there answering that phone or taking your message and getting back to you uh, within you know a 24 hour period at the latest. Um, also uh, in existence in the state of Vermont is what's known as the Vermont Help Link. This is a telephone number and service that the Vermont Department of Health has put together and contracted with a provider that basically helps people get linked up to substance abuse services across the state, whatever level of care that individual needs. And they will also help them schedule their first appointment in terms of getting into those services. Um, and that number here is 802-565-LINK. Um, and you can also check out their website. Uh, it has a lot of excellent resources on there in terms of information about accessing services in Vermont. One of the things that I want to kind of emphasize, um, you saw some of the numbers about overdose numbers climbing up 85% since the epidemic started. Um, another number that has really jumped uh, that is very uh, troubling for me as well is the number of alcohol-related deaths since the start of COVID. Uh, the number of alcohol-related deaths across the country uh, went up 25% uh, year over from the year 2019 to 2020. Um, it had never gone up that much in any given year since they started tracking these numbers. The highest or the average it had ever, ever gone up was 2.3%. So to go up 25% is, a, you, know, sig you know, very significant. And so, you know, this pandemic, uh, its, its impact on not only, you know, people utilizing and, and trying to find ways to deal with their stress and their anxiety through substances, um, opioids, it, it's real and it's hitting us harder than it ever has. And, and so it's more important for us to have these conversations and these kind of community dialogues that talk about how do we help people and what avenues are there for folks. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. If you folks have questions uh, during this evening, I'm here to answer any kind of questions that folks have. I know there are other folks Adam, who have to go. We're in Waterbury. Can you just comment sure. on, I know we have a couple of the providers here from Waterbury. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, what's available to people here? So here, here in Waterbury, through our primary care practice, uh, Waterbury uh, Primary Care, we have three uh, MAP providers who are providing services in the MAP team. They they provide services and see patients who are on buprenorphine uh, through primary care practices. Um, we also have uh, counselors that are available through the primary care practices that can get referred through primary care providers as well as embedded Washington County mental health counselors at the primary care practice here. We also uh, you know, do a lot of collaborations 
with Hannah's house in terms of trying to make people connected to services down in Waitsfield through our uh, Mad River practice and so forth. So, you know, we're always trying to make sure that people can get access to help, often knowing that sometimes it's not coming in in a timely fashion when it comes to behavioral health services, but realizing that, you know, if people are absolutely in crisis, you know, the emergency department is, is the place to go. And, you know, as, as Dr. Detman had mentioned earlier, being able to, you know, utilize the emergency room if you're in a crisis situation and really need that level of help, those services are there to help people. Great. Okay, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Right it is a big trip. No, it, it is a big issue. And, and one of the things that we've done uh, was to uh, get one of our map providers out of Waterbury, uh, Allison Hobart, who uh, once we have a few more people who are able to be seen down there, we do have a number of people who live in the Mad River Valley who are our mat services who do get their primary care down there. And our goal really is to link people up with their primary care practice and have MAP providers in every primary care practice. So they're not in the situation of what you're saying of like living all the way down in Faiston or you know Lower Warren and having to get all the way up to Waterbury or for that matter, all to Berlin. So yeah, we're, we're working directly on that issue. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and it, it's really good feedback for you all to validate the need in the Mad River Valley south of Waterbury. Of course, it is a small practice, and it's a challenge for us to be able to bring those services there. But I think it's great that Lori and Peter are here to hear that. Um, I also just want to re reconnect. Uh, MAT, of course, many of it, most people know MAT stands for, it has a couple of different re meanings, but I think of it as medication-assisted treatment. Um, and we are answering the call with the alcohol crisis. Um, we're doing a pilot right now in the emergency room where we've got a medical model for MAT for alcohol use and a connection to psychotherapy-based treatment. Um, and we're hoping in the next couple of years to really strengthen that into primary care. Alcohol use is already treated in primary care pretty darn well, um, but we're looking to bring some more connections, a little more specialty consultative ability for primary care providers to have dealing with that very difficult problem. Okay. Great. And I think we can definitely dive into this a little bit more um, during the Q&A. So hold on to that thought. But um, thank you for both for answering. Um, Matina, I see that your hand is up. I'd love to give you a chance to talk. I am uh, so sorry, Eva, but just listening, you know, uh, to Evan and Mark and also being thankfully reminded by Alice, who is in the audience on Zoom today, I totally forgot to also mention that um, we are also offering, you know, at Vermont Cares at the syringe service programs, um, immediate super low barrier access to uh, Suboxone, to buprenorphine um, in a total harm reduction fashion because we are collaborating with um, Alice's organization, which is Better Life Partners. And so we also, when people are ready and want to you know, seek out um, treatment, we can immediately, like they call, we get them in immediately and 40 minutes later, they pick up their script um, at the at the pharmacy. And this is all over Zoom. People can do it in our office, but they can do it from home if they you know struggle with, with Wi-Fi or accessing a tablet. We can come to them and support them in that. And that goes, of course, uh, that's in the Medford Valley as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've talked about treatment sort of more on the adult side, but I'm going to turn it over to Bert now from Washington County Youth Services Bureau um, and keep this moving along so that we have time for the community forum part of the community forum. <laughs> All right, Bert, take it away. All right, thanks, Eva. So my name's Bert Clavens. I'm the director of the Healthy Youth Program, or HIP, which is a program of the Washington County Youth Service Bureau, which is now located in Berlin, Vermont. Um, the Healthy Youth Program provides outpatient substance use education and treatment that is geared specifically to the needs of adolescents and young adults, which we consider to be age 12 to 25. Um, HIP utilizes a holistic approach to treatment that emphasizes relationship building, 
draws on a variety of treatment approaches to address needs and is flexible to the unique challenges of young people seeking treatment. Uh, Washington County Youth Service Bureau also provides a range of other programs for young people, such as mental health counseling, transitional housing services, and we have our basement teen center, which is in Montpelier for people that's relevant for. <laughs> um, all our services are easy to access by calling the number on the slide and talking to our central intake staff. And uh, just as another note, um, if you do think that your child might be using drugs or alcohol, the best thing you can do is reach out for some help and guidance. It doesn't have to be a big problem to justify doing that. Uh, your doctors, substance use counselors, school or mental health counselors, all can be helpful. And uh, at the Healthy Youth Program, we're always happy to hear from you and try to answer any questions you might have. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bert. And could you just speak for a moment about access for the area that we're in now, Waterbury, Mad River Valley? Um, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, two things there is um, uh, we do uh, we do do remote services through, you know, digital, you know, we use Zoom. <laughs> what do you call that? We use Zoom. So we can provide for people where distance is an issue. Uh, we do have that available. Um, we, um, you know, it depends on the different schools. We actually uh, try to, as much as possible, uh, locate our services in the communities that are being served. And we work with different schools to, to do that. Um, you know, COVID has made things more complicated with people coming into buildings and so on. But uh, um, we're willing, you know, we're willing to go out and, and uh, you know, meet people um, down in the communities as much as we can. So, um, but otherwise, like I said, if you call our, if you call our, just our, that number on the slide, it's a central intake number and they'll connect you with one of our counselors, not right away, but we'll, we'll get back to you and, um, yeah, and try to work out the best way to help you get services. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm now going to pass it on to Bob Purvis from the Turning Point Center of Central Vermont to talk about recovery. Sure, I'm the director of the Turning Point uh, Recovery Center. We're located in Barrie, but we serve all of central Vermont. All of our services are free of charge to anyone. We're a peer recovery center, which means that everyone who works here has a personal history of an alcohol or other drug addiction and recovery from it. That's true for me. I've been in recovery for just about 18 years now. Because we peers have been there, quote unquote, we are able to relate to people who are struggling with substances in a way that others can't. Our job is to help each person find their own pathway to recovery, and there are many pathways to recovery. A recovery center is a place where a person can go to receive individual or group support. We provide a wide range of programs that can help people regain their health and enrich their lives. It's also a place where people in recovery can meet and become friends with others who are doing the same thing and learn to once again have fun and play games while sober. The most important service we provide is recovery coaching. Recovery coaches are highly trained peers who connect with folks who are embarking on recovery or maybe exploring what recovery might mean to them. The coach helps the person think through what their goals are and what steps they wish to take to reach them. Along the way, the coach will connect the person with resources that can help them overcome barriers and strengthen their capacities. The end result is a healthier and more fulfilling life. As I said, there are many pathways to recovery. Our job is to help a person find the path that is right for them. Our recovery coaches work in a variety of settings. In addition to meeting people who come to the center, we have coaches working in the CV CVMC emergency department, as it says up on the screen, and also with the Montpelier Police Department. They can meet in person by phone or video conferencing. We support both individuals and families. And I'd like to say that, you know, if, you, if you're if you not sure what you want or where you want to go or where you need to go, you can give us a call because we can talk to you and help you work out what it is you, you want to do. Now I'd like to turn you over to Lucy, a woman who has worked hard on her recovery and who we always look forward to seeing at Turning Point. Hi, Lucy. I was uh, in my 20s, and 
it did everything for me. All the anxiety, all the um, doubt and, and um, trauma was gone. And, uh, and I ran that for the last 30 years. Um, and uh, it, it, it totally, totally ruined my life. I lost a child, I, I, I lost my mother, I got a divorce in a year, and I, it was all over alcohol. I didn't lose my mother for alcohol, but it was all over alcohol. And I don't know who's in this room, um, but this is, this is beautiful. I, I, this is my third uh, community meeting, and just to see everybody in here, you know, either wanting to help or wanting to share and have, um, have our backs, have our support, you know, and making me stronger. Um, in turn, I want to, I want to make you stronger. It's a, it, I want to turn it into a win-win in my life now. Um, I didn't want to live. I never was like that. I never wanted to commit suicide. I never wanted to give up. And that's where I was. And so when, I'm sorry, Martina mentioned people meeting you where you are, that's what Turning Point did for me. They, they met me exactly where I was. And I, I'd run, and then, you know, I just remember them. They just kept nagging me, you know, because I knew that if I couldn't go anywhere else, I could go there. And nobody was going to be like, you know, oh, Lucy, come on, get it together, or something like that. You know, they just they have a big smile, you want know, some coffee, or you want, you know, and it just, it, it means everything. You know, when you destroy your life, you, you, you don't have any, but you don't have yourself. And to go in there and be supported and get the help I needed and the encouragement each and every time meant everything to me. Um, I'm currently now in school um, because I want to be a contributor to, to this community. This community has been very good to me. And um, it just means a lot that you all even just asked me to do this. So I really appreciate everyone being here and really just trying to um, help us. You know, and, and uh, we'll be there for you. I promise. We will. Thank you. Lucy, thank you. I, every time you share your story at these forums, it's um, so passionate and um, real gift to everybody here. So thank you for being here, sharing your experience. And Lucy will also be available during the um, open forum part to answer questions and um, along with the rest of us. Um, okay, I'm going to turn it over at this point to Ann Gilbert from Central Vermont New Directions Coalition to talk about primary prevention. Thank you, Eva. Um, hi, I'm Ann Gilbert. I'm the director of Central Vermont New Directions. Um, we focus on healthy communities and working with partners to prevent youth substance use. We're based in Montpelier. Um, we've been around since 1998. We're funded primarily through grants from the Vermont Department of Health um, to address tobacco use, underage drinking, prescription drugs, and really to prevent youth cannabis use now too, which is the newer legal term for marijuana. And um, you know, we're we're trying to stop something before it starts, and this really does take a village. It's so important to have multiple partners on board to help make a difference. We really appreciate um, and need parents, youth, schools, select boards, um, businesses, and policymakers. And we provide information and education about substances um, because we really understand that kids are at great risk of drug problems and mental health problems and addiction when they start using at an early age. Um, you know, before the age of 13 can really have a dramatic effect on their dependence um, and addiction later on in life. Um, and even if it's nicotine through smoking or vaping, um, their brains are just not fully developed until they are at least 25 years old. So we're currently presenting to health classes in middle and high schools about substances. Um, we know now that vaping is a pediatric health crisis. 
especially during the pandemic, there have been problems with um, alcohol and prescription drug use, as you've heard. And New Directions is a resource for how kids can get help quitting. Um, we do parent education presentations. We follow the bills to inform our legislators about um, uh, pertinent topics like the risks of flavored tobacco products and uh, how they're harmful to our kids. And um, we do help out in Waterbury area and uh, the Mad River Valley. In fact, um, our prevention coordinator, Will Roberts is on today and he's um, uh, been going out to classes uh, at the Harwood Middle School um, to talk about vaping and substance use. So thank you, um, Eva. Um, you know, I, I guess I should also mention that we work so closely with Vermont Department of Health and Matt Whalen, who could not be on tonight. Um, he's on paternity leave, congratulations. But he is the prevention consultant for our, um, our, our health district, which is called the Berry District. Um, but it really includes all of Washington County and the six uh, school districts, which are in our area. And he has a wealth of information and can really link um, parents and community members up with uh, resources as well. So he and I work very closely together. And um, it's good to know about the Vermont Department of Health being an incredible resource. Great. Thank you, Anne, and for introducing Matt. Um, so these are the resources that are available. There are more resources, but these are really the key resources that are available for substance use, primary prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery. Um, and all of these folks will be available in just a few minutes when we get to the community forum part of the evening, and you are welcome to ask them questions um, at that point. Are there any questions about what you just saw? Do you need to see a phone number again? No, sounds good. Okay, so what I'd like to do at this point is we're gonna transition into some more specific information about primary prevention um, because uh, if we can really stop you know, the problem before it becomes a problem, that's ultimately everybody's goal. Um, so I'd like to turn it back over to Anne now who's going to walk us through um, uh, what primary prevention is and some data. Great, thanks Eva. So let's start with um, just taking a, uh, a look at this um, Vermont stream, you know, right in the springtime, it's really rushing. So join me in picturing this. Imagine a large river with a high waterfall and at the bottom of this waterfall, hundreds of people are working frantically trying to save those who have fallen into the river and have fallen down the waterfall. Many of them are drowning. And as the people along the shore are trying to rescue as many as possible, one individual looks up and sees a seemingly never ending stream of people falling down the waterfall and begins to run upstream. Well, one of the other rescuers yells, where are you going? There are so many people that need help right here. To which this woman replies, I'm going upstream to find out why so many people are falling into the river. So as she heads upstream, she notices bridges in various states of disrepair along the river. Some are strong, made of sturdy components. Others are weak and debilitated with missing boards or flimsy railings. It doesn't surprise her that most of the people falling in the river are crossing these poorly made bridges. And those individuals that live near or travel across the strong bridges are protected. Of course, all of the bridges could use more reinforcement, but it's easy to see which bridges need the most attention. So in this stream parable, if you will, we know that there are certain groups of people that are more likely to fall in the river than others. They do not fall in because of individual weaknesses or intrinsic flaws, but rather we do know that some people are privileged to live in communities with strong bridges, usually made of high quality materials um, that could use more reinforcement. Um, but 
there are materials that protect them from falling in the river and promoting their safe passage across. Next slide. So there are key points um, that we really want to mention tonight. And um, uh, Harwood Union has higher use rates for most substances when we compare them to the rest of the state of Vermont. We also know that Vermont as a whole, the young people are among the highest users in the country for most substances. But the good news is there are things that we can do to um, control this and make some changes. Next slide. So um, the middle school and high school students at all the schools, many, most of the schools in Vermont take the youth risk behavior survey every two years at school. And so this is called the YRBS and the, this is data from 2019. So when we look at this, the Harwood High School, I'm showing you just the high school numbers, not middle school tonight, but you can see um, that Harwood uh, students report, 65% of Harwood students report that they have ever had alcohol compared to Vermont, 55%. So that's statistically higher with alcohol. And here on this slide, um, the, it's statistically higher with marijuana use as well. 55% of Harwood students ever used marijuana or cannabis um, compared to 40% in the state. When it comes to prescription pain medicine use, um, misuse, actually, Harwood students were at 12% compared to 9% um, overall in Vermont. And for stimulant use, prescription stimulants, Harwood students using at a, the rate of 11% um, rather than uh, compared to Vermont at 7%. Um, so this survey, the YRBS, also shows that fewer students believe that it is wrong for someone their age to drink alcohol um, or to smoke marijuana. These are specific questions on the survey. Um, and, um, and so for the Harwood students to have statistically lower numbers in this is a concern. Fewer students believe their parents would think it was wrong or very wrong for them to use alcohol or marijuana. And more students have access to marijuana and alcohol than students in the rest of the state. Now, we do know that um, Harwood has uh, high numbers um, compared to the state. And when we look at Washington County at, as an average, um, they are a little bit in between. Washington County usually pulls a little bit higher than the whole state, but Harwood it has higher numbers. Um, next slide. So we also can look at Vermont youth. This is um, from NISDA, um, the National Survey on Drugs um, uh, and uh, on health. And this is 12 to 17 year olds, 11% um, used marijuana in the past 30 days compared to 7% in the United States. So just as Eva was showing you the data from the young adults, um, 18 to 25 year olds in the beginning, we're also concerned about the 12 to 17 year olds for Vermont as a whole. Next slide. Um, 12% using alcohol in the past 30 days compared to 9% using alcohol in the United States. Next, alcohol use in the past month, 27% um, in Vermont compared to the 17% uh, in the US. And when we talk about binge alcohol use in the past month, Vermonters ages 12 to 20 are much higher at 17% compared to 10%. And we, we see this in the numbers at the high school age as well, which is very concerning because binge drinking is four to five alcoholic drinks within a short period of time, which might be you know under two hours. And when you think about the risk of that amount of alcohol to the teen brain and so many other parts of the human body and 
you know, driving or um, risky sexual behavior, um, violence, drownings, um, uh, binge drinking is a is a real concern. So there are things that we can do. Uh, we can change some things that contribute to the youth use. And number one is the availability of substances. We really, um, in prevention, we talk a lot about access and availability of substances. And um, what does that look like? Are they in the home? I mean, especially during the pandemic, this has been a challenging time with um, kids at home and parents at home and uh, stress and access to alcohol and, um, you know, with uh, retail cannabis on the, um, you know, coming up this fall, there's been a lot more use with that and prescription drugs hanging around in people's medicine cabinets because um, people think, oh, they might, you know, need to use that again sometime or they just haven't bothered to get rid of it. Um, number two, the amount that young people know about the impacts that substances have on their bodies and their brains really do need more information and education for them. That can happen at school, but it also needs to happen in the home. Parents are a huge influence, getting regular checkups so doctors can talk to uh, their patients about this, um, discussing it when you see social media or movies. Number three, the amount of protective factors that young people have in their lives. Now, this is really important when you think about what does that look like? You know, all young people um, uh, need a caring adult uh, or a teacher at their school that they can go to if there's a problem. Uh, it really makes a difference uh, who they're hanging out with. Do they have a healthy peer group? It's important that they have a family that communicates or maybe sits down for a meal at least four times a week. Um, that these kids are involved in activities, um, you know, healthy risk taking, maybe mountain biking or skiing or snowboarding. Um, and then number four, the community norms around alcohol and other drugs. So what do, what do kids see? I mean, are they seeing lots of signs um, when on their way to school for you know cheap beer or uh, the best uh, um, craft beer? Uh, in the United States? Um, are they seeing uh, alcohol at family-friendly events? Um, you know, is there uh, regular vaping and cannabis use out in the open? Um, or, or are there um, pretty strict rules or guidelines or protective factors around what that looks like in the community? Next slide. So, the Vermont prevention model really is a diagram that kind of shows that it does take a village. It takes so many different partners to really make a difference in curbing that um, youth substance use. And we start with the policies and systems, which is really this surrounding area. Now, these are the local and state and federal policies. These are the laws that really help um, provide a framework um, and the media. And when I think back about growing up when there were tobacco commercials on TV all the time and on the radio, and you could smoke on an airplane and in bars and restaurants, and how, um, de how much smoking was decreased because of the overall policies and laws that came into place prohibiting a lot of um, that smoking in media. And even in the community, what does your cultural environment look like? Um, for organizations, you know, um, are your faith-based organizations or your schools or your work sites, are they smoke-free? Are there policies that everyone understands and consequences also? And relationships, your family, your friends. And then it really comes down to the individual. What do they know? What's their knowledge? What is their attitudes and beliefs? And so we can't depend on just educating the one individual. They need to be able to live in a world where it's supportive of prevention. Next slide. So at home, we protect our children and families from lead and asbestos, radon, chemicals, bad drinking water. So maybe it's time to really add all the substances to that list. Look around your home, do a survey. Is alcohol readily available? Is cannabis 
Um, are there tobacco products and vaping products? What about the prescription medications? Um, sort of taking a survey of all of that and realizing that all of those can be harmful to kids, you know, whether they're toddlers um, and you're locking them up or all through elementary, middle, high school and until they're, you know, 21 or older, um, really to help prevent misuse and poisonings or addiction. Slide. So the perception of harm is a real concern. You know, do 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 kids really not think that um, uh, this would be harmful to them, or they don't think that their parents would really think it would be harmful to them? And what we know is that um, for you know, in the Harwood Union uh, School District, there's a low perception of harm. And so how do we raise the alarm about that? And, um, you know, parents talking to other parents about it, um, parents talking to their, their teens about it would be really helpful. Slide. So what can we do to make a change? Continue to monitor the availability of substances um, to young people. Talk to them, talk to kids in your life about the impacts of substances on their bodies and brains. Talk early when they're young and talk often and get more used to it so that you're desensitized a little bit. Um, you know, we say it's not about having one 60 minute conversation, but think about having 60 one minute conversations. Um, you can focus on bolstering those protective factors in young people's lives. Maintain strong school policies and procedures. You know, do the kids know what the consequences are um, if uh, they violate that at school or at home? And um, promote the screening of students um, so that they can get referred to treatment. So some of the resources that are available through the Vermont Department of Health are this Parent Up Vermont. You can go to the to uh, parentupvt.org. It's on the Vermont Department of Health website. And this really gives parents facts and resources that they might need in order to talk to their kids about it, whether they're just needing some factual information, whether they think there might be a problem or whether they know their kids are using. There's a lot of um, information about cannabis, mental wellness, and other issues. And then CVNDC is Central Vermont New Directions Coalition. You can go to cvndc.org um, and uh, or you could reach out to myself, Ann Gilbert, or our prevention coordinator, Will Roberts, who's been doing some of the education in the um, in the middle school and working with um, some of the teen groups at, at the high school as well. And so this is just a quick snapshot of what you would see if you go to the parentupvt.org website. Um, that yes, parenting can be tough. And so we need these tools, we need a script, we need information in order to help us navigate this. And um, there's plenty of information there, including how to find some treatment services if you feel like that. So one way to get the prescription medications out of your house is to really take a look in those drawers or medicine cabinets. Where are they? If they're old and expired or you're not using them anymore. We have the prescription drug take back day coming up this Saturday on April 30th. It's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And you can drop them off at any of the six collection sites in Washington County. And this is organized by local law enforcement in the Washington County Sheriff's Department. You could go to the, um, the uh, Montpelier Police Department or the Barry Police Department. But if, um, you know, there used to be a drop box at the kiosk at uh, the, the Rite Aid Pharmacy in Waitsfield, but that's no longer there. So you can lock things up. And um, if you're uh, in person in the room there, you might be able to pick up a lock box um, you know, there are bags available or um, New Directions even has um, locking bins with um, a combination lock on there or uh, a medicine box that you could lock your prescription medications up in so they're safe around the house. 
you could drop them off at any of the kiosks um, at the police, any of the police stations in Washington County or at some like the Kinney's in Waterbury has a, a drop box and they are one of the locations for the drug take back day on Saturday. Um, or you can mail them back. We have prescription drug mail back envelopes and you just put the medications right in an envelope, you seal it up and you drop it right in the mailbox and they get sent off to be um, incinerated. And that's uh, totally free, they're postage prepaid. Those. And those are envelopes, those envelopes are available at um, uh, your local library, town offices, senior center, um, and um, at the medical center, Central Vermont Medical Center. So I encourage you to, that would be one place to start, especially with spring cleaning coming up, is to get the meds out of the house and lock up your other substances as well. Thank you. Great, Anne, that was so informative. Thank you so much um, for all of the data, the information, and all of the things that we can do. Um, so those bags and boxes are in the back if you're here in person, you should feel free to take one of them with you and some pizza. Okay, so we are at the community forum part of this time. Um, so I'd like to open it up both in person and Zoom. You have all of these experts here today. You have people from your community here. Um, we'd love to take your questions, comments, um, and sort of start a conversation. Um, is there anyone that has a question or a comment that they'd like to make? This is Phyllis. I have one, if I may. Please, Phyllis, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I forget the woman's name that was speaking um, that had gone with the alcohol issue. I can't remember her name, but I would, if, is she available to ask a question of? Lucy, yes, Lucy yes, is Lucy, here. Lucy, yes, that's sorry, I forgot your name. Um, Lucy, what made, was there anything any of your family or friends could have done that would have propelled you to seek help sooner? I have a family member who's got a fairly heavy duty drug problem that doesn't acknowledge it. And I, I don't, you know, we, we know that all the stuff is there, but is there anything that you, that would have made you seek help sooner? Hi, Phyllis, thank you. Um, no, I, of course my family uh, for many years, decades begged me to quit and I didn't think I had a problem. Um, it was divine intervention. Um, and I know it sounds odd, but it, it came from my kitty. I had a new kitty and that low moment, I, uh, I, <laughs> I had enough alcohol in, in the, uh, in the room that I had locked myself in to just, to just kill myself. And it was me and my cat. And I looked down there and she was sleeping just so peaceful like everything was great and, you know, we're safe. And um, I said, I told myself, I, I got to do better. I would have been sober a long time ago if it was left up to anyone else. But just keep loving him and and encouraging him along. But I, you know, I try not to be accusatory because this has been going on for 20 years now, and um, I don't want to miss anything that I could tell him that might influence him that way. But um, I, I sort of thought it has to be something you do on your own, because no matter what. It is definitely that. But don't stop loving. We're listening, even though we're hard headed. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Bob, I'd like to also open it up to you to see if you um, have anything you'd like to share. Well, there's truth in what Lucy said that there has to be something inside of you that that decides that, that there's a click that says, "I'm going. I've got to do something." But um, you know, it's you can be 
open to signs that the person is thinking that they might have a problem and you don't want to label them or, uh, or jump to a conclusion and say, you are this, or you are that, which never helps, but you can encourage conversation about how their life is going. What's, what's ha- what's going on in their life. And, uh, and if they're, if you, if you if you can see visible signs that their, their their life has been adversely affected by their use, then you can maybe get into a conversation about that. And at a certain point, well, what do you think is the problem? Uh, you don't you don't tell what the problem is, but you ask what the problem is, and you listen, and uh, uh, and you just you do the best you can in that regard. But as Lucy said, you can't you can't get them. You telling them they need help only first causes them to back up on their heels more. Uh, but you need to be the loving person in their life that you are at the same time. So don't ever, don't ever give up on that. Bob, could you also talk about supports that are available to family members? Yes, there are a number of support groups uh, in the community that, that are there to support families. There are times when you need to decide not to enable their continued use. And, but you might not always know where to draw the line. So if you enable them to continue using, of course, then that further delays their dealing with it. But, but, um, but you want to be sure that the things you're, you're trying to do are not punitive, that you're not going to punish them into it. That doesn't work. But the, the nice thing about support groups is that you, can, you may know in your heart that you should not take them someplace or you should not give them money. There are things you should not do this because you know it's just going to enable them to keep using more. Uh, and at that point, um, you, it helps to have people who have been there and done that and who can give you the encouragement and support you need to be tough in some cases. You know, there are times when you just simply have to say no or you have to draw a line. And it's hard because they're your family. Uh, but if you are in if you're in a group of people who have been through that, they can support you and give you tips on how to do it. We have uh, we have two groups that meet here at Turning Point. One is called Families Anonymous. And it's to support family members of uh, anyone who's struggling with a substance of any kind. Uh, and then we also have an Al-Anon group here. Both are very welcoming and open. They're not, you know, hardcore anything. And uh, they're caring people who, who have been there. And they can, you know, give you a hug if you're it's in person and say, we're there with you. We, we'll support you. We know what's going on in your life. And uh, and tell us what's tell us what's happening specifically, and maybe we can give you a few pointers on how you can deal with it. So that's about the best I can offer. Yeah, Bob, thanks so much. I wonder um, if you would be, or Olivia maybe would be able to drop Turning Point's phone number, contact information into the chat for anyone who's interested in learning more about those services. And Bob, your meetings are hybrid. Is that right? Um, actually, those those the, the Al-Anon meeting is, but the Families Anonymous meeting is not. And I should say that you can always call here if you have a if you have a question and you're not sure what to do, call here. Um, and I'm I'm always here, and I'll be happy to talk with you. I've been here for like over 11 years now. Who'd have thunk that? And, uh, and I've talked to a lot of family members, particularly wives and and spouses, and you know, and family about the, their spouse and about their kids. And the one thing that, that people who are family members don't know, they feel isolated and alone, and they don't know that they need help too, because the, the illness affects everybody in the family. And I've had people just start crying on the phone when I tell them, you know, you need support too. <laughs> you need help too, just as much as the person in your life who's using. So uh, take, please take that message. And, uh, uh, and again, you can always call here, even if you just want to ventilate a little bit. And I'd be happy to connect you with some other resources if I can. Uh, and there, there's, there are a lot of people around here who are willing to support you. And that's the turning point number? I'm not seeing it right now. Yes. It? Yes, okay. Phyllis, that, that number right there, you can call. You can call me anytime. That's what we're here for. Bob and Lucy, thanks so much for answering Phyllis's question. Phyllis, is there anything else that we can help you with? No, I'll probably follow up. It's just getting to a point that it's becoming really problematic. Um, and I just really don't want him to die, but he's that's the way he's going right at the moment. So, um, all right, thank you. Thank you so much.
All right, any other, anything else that we can answer? Yes. Um, thank you everyone who's presented today. It's been really useful to have you here. Um, I don't know if you can talk to what, if any, engagement with youth you've done, maybe besides presenting in a health class. I don't know if that's part of this model. You know, I'm 27. My least thing is initiatives about young professionals that don't talk with young professionals. So I just don't know if that's part of this work. Yeah, so the question is what um, sort of engagement with young people has happened beyond maybe education? Am I hitting that correctly? Sure. Um, so I'll probably turn this over, back over to Anne, um, although I'd love, Anne, maybe you could also mention um, Up for Learning as an organization that um, would be good to know about. Yeah. Right. Good. Thanks. Yeah. So there is an organization called Up for Learning, and there are groups in the schools that get together um, with an advisor and take a look at the youth risk behavior survey data from their school and learn how to analyze it so that they can um, be aware of where the um, maybe some problem areas and what they're doing really well at in their school and what what's it, what are challenges and then develop some action steps for how they might make some changes um, in the school. But Up for Learning also um, offers restorative practices training and um, uh, youth and school conversations. So they're a good resource too. And, um, um, but I do, I do feel that, you know, we're so concerned about the young adult population right now. And if we haven't caught them as elementary school kids or middle school or high school, and now they're between the ages of 18 to 25, which is just such an, a continued high risk time, we're, um, we're New Directions is really hoping to talk to more employers about what um, some of the businesses that are hiring this age group can really do um, in terms of having a wellness program or having conversations or having um, uh, allowing people to be able to go out and get treatment um, that would help with their recovery if they needed it or having just having an awareness of what are all the social events that you have going on for your business or for your employees? Do they all involve alcohol or partying? Um, or can there be other things that are fun that could be substance free as well so that you're kind of sending that sort of message? Um, we, um, there, there are groups in a number of the schools that are already formed um, because they care about social justice issues or um, maybe the LGBTQ uh, groups or, um, and so Will Roberts, our prevention coordinator is reaching out to a number of those student groups to connect. And, you know, I, a lot of times it's, it's having another um, adult just around as sort of a good role model, um, if you will. And, um, you know, uh, the, Youth Service Bureau has the Basement Teen Center, which is in Montpelier. But you know, what are the places in the community in the Mad River Valley or in the in Waterbury where where teens can go um, and it can be a safe environment? You know, skiing and snowboarding is a great sport, but you know, sometimes that's that might be you know um, you know kind of a risky place at the mountain as well. So. Was there something else specific that you were, you know, that, that you're trying to get at that maybe one of us could answer? Good, thank you. By your question a bit to wonder, I'm gonna reflect this back to the community. Um, and I don't know how many of you are parents with children in this audience, but do you, are you frustrated that there does not seem to be any interest among parents in the school district around these issues? I mean, there's been so much focus around COVID and so many other things to distract us, but where, where does this land? Do you feel like there just isn't a unifying force around doing something? I grew up in the Mad River Valley and uh, the culture of drinking and drugging being cool and 
part of the scene is very real. It has been since I was young. And I think I have two children at Harwood right now. Uh, my 10th grader recently said to me, you know, you and so-and-so's parents are really lucky. You're the only parents at Harwood who have kids that don't do drugs. And she's in 10th grade. And, uh, you know, that warms my heart, makes me happy, but it makes me really sad for her community. Um, I'm really glad to hear that Will is in the, Will, it's Liza Kane, I know you. <laughs> I'm really glad to know you're in the middle school at Harwood because we have to start there. They're all using and vaping and there's drug deals going on in the bathrooms and I feel like there is a blind eye. My daughter was on lacrosse team a couple of years ago and during halftime, her teammates were in the bathroom vaping. And Harwood claims to have a zero tolerance policy. And everyone knows these kids are using and not doing anything. So Anne talked about the sort of having um, protocols and follow through that are realistic and, and that there's accountability. There is none. There is none. They turn their eyes because the teams are really good and they don't want to ruin their their teams. So yes, I'm on fire. Can you tell? <laughs> so it, would you say there's like there's just not a critical mass of parents that care enough that this I is parents, of all the things going on in the world, this isn't. I think the parents are part of the problem. I'm sorry to say, and and we have a cultural problem. You know, Lucy, your access. Thank you for sharing to alcohol. It's it's. I think our problem is that we revere alcohol. I don't think you have a problem because you had trouble with alcohol. I think alcohol is altering, and we have to change our, our whole mindset. And the isolation, you know, we've all been talking about small towns, and the further you get from Waterbury down into the valley, the smaller the towns are, and the less access people have to things. So I'm very grateful to hear that there's more treatment coming to the the clinic here and in, and in Waitsfield. Um, I think Al-Anon groups and AA groups in the Valley are hard because it's a small community and there is so much stigma around getting help um, because of course you have to admit there's a problem and then everyone is afraid the people in the community are going to know that they have a problem. Yeah. And like, let's celebrate them. They're getting help. Yeah. Yeah. No, for us as a as you know, leaders in this coalition and active members of the work at the work we all do, this is so sobering to hear. Mm -hmm. um, just because we know we we've always known it's the case. I mean, the further you get into the smaller towns, you get away from Barry and Montpelier and Berlin, where all the services are located. You get into these smaller towns and. There's just, it's just harder to connect with people. It's harder to get your a message across. Um, and we want to work really hard at trying to help you all solve that. Um, but it does, it's real community action. I mean, it just takes a critical mass of people to stand up to your school board. And, you know, and I, we can't do that, but we can help. And I think Ann and Will and Bob are really, you know, you've heard their voices around this. And they're there to help to whatever degree we can. Um, and maybe in the future, we'll be able to help even more. Um, but so much of that has to do with individual school boards and um, select boards and how they want to spend money and how much goes back into revitalizing the arts program and the theater program and what sports and keeping kids, just give them things to do and be busy. Build a maker lab in your town and have a mentor run it. I mean, there's just... It just takes that level of creativity and commitment from a critical mass of people. So, so I really. Have, there are teen centers here, and there's this building, the library, but teens don't want to come here. No. <laughs> no. no every <laughs> time I hear someone. Library. <laughs> every time I hear someone my age say, well, we just need a teen center. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> teen center. Yeah. There isn't anywhere for kids to go to do stuff. No, when they're distances, they have to drive, and mm -hmm. not everyone drives. No one has a car to drive. It's, yeah, it's tough. It's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's why networks of yeah. caring parents can make a difference. Yeah. Knowing your, knowing your kids' friends, knowing what they're doing, having curfews, agreeing on curfews, 
agreeing on rules when kids go to each other's homes. But I don't, I don't know what that community is like here, but it's what you sort of want, right? Well, I can tell you, I was, uh, I was at Harwood today, actually all day. Uh, I taught a class around uh, vaping use um, in four of their core classes today. So basically all day. Um, and I can tell you, they were not, I brought up the YRBS data and they were not surprised in the slightest. Uh, they knew that they were high numbers and they knew that it was above state averages. Um, and they also knew that it was a relatively easy to get uh, vapes and and e-liquids and it was rel either they and they all shared this with me either it was easy from family members or it was easy to just go to the store and give a couple extra dollars and they could buy themselves so you know so there's a lot you know it's not exactly uh not exactly happy news, but but they the the kids are very aware of um, of the issue, what the problem is, and they also said to me uh, when I when I asked, you know, well, what you know, what happens if you get caught? Nothing, nothing happens, and so so there's a lot. What they said in this forty minute class, but I had several of these forty minute classes. Um, there's a lot of levels to this, you know, um, I think school response is lacking. It sounds like to me, um, parental and community response is kind of lacking. It sounds like to me, um, and the, the kids are, they are, I don't know. It's not that they don't care, but they are sort of complacent, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Um, really important question. Um, we, uh, I want to let you know that um, the school board was invited tonight. They unfortunately had to move their school board meeting to the same time that this community forum is. But thanks to Orca, we are able to record this meeting and it will be available uh, to the school board to review later. So thank you, Orca. I should have thanked you all um, in the beginning for, for helping us tonight. When we, when you, did, did you present that, some of that data to the school board? Or would... um, we didn't present the data to, the, to them. I'm just saying, I mean, if, if there's enough of you that can Yes, the statement from Dr. Detman was that we'd be really happy to help speak to school boards um, anytime and help present information. Thank you. Yeah, Elliot. Eva, my question's for Will. I heard you mention you're at Harwood Middle. Are you at Crossbrook Middle? Will, can you hear no, that question? Okay. okay. Uh, no, so today and uh, next week I'm just at Harwood. I would love to be at Crossbrook, though. Is there a barrier to being at Crossbrook? Mm -hmm. So far, no. So, I mean, it has been historically in the last two years. COVID, of course, is getting it back into school. So that's been that's been a thing. So, but but things are loosening up lately, and so we've been able to get into more schools, which is great. So, uh, yeah, Crossbrook, uh, I would be happy to reach out. And uh, if you have connections um, there, I would gladly take them and, and talk to them. Thank you, Will. Do you have Will's contact? I'm just a parent of a fifth grader. <laughs> but I mean, I can, I can ask and I could um, reach out to Anne. I have her email. Because um, I, I understand very clearly why Will has visited Harwood Mill for the vaping. I don't know if that's an issue across the Brook Middle, but it just seems to make sense sure. to well, start early. Are you talking about vaping, or are you, are you going to be discussing other things like Harwood? Well, I didn't hear. There was a question for me. I couldn't hear it. Yeah, the question is, are you um, just discussing vaping at Harwood, or are other substances on? 
They asked me to come in for just vaping, but um, but we've got presentations on all substances. So so that that's easy to do. So would it help? Will well, would it help for this audience to understand how you get into these schools? You know, it, it, do you have to kind of make the case or be asked? And if that doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. That's basically it. Yeah. So, um, so I reach out to schools, um, and, you know, give them samples of a presentation kind of thing. And, uh, they, they will either ask me or, or they won't. Um, sometimes, uh, I just did a series in Cabot and they actually reached out to us, uh, which was great. And so then I went in and did a four week series in a health class. Um, and, uh, but I had reached out to, uh, to Harwood, um, uh, myself. So. And I was, uh, Bert, I was going to ask you if, if, does your organization reach into schools around the county, especially in the smaller towns, or is that not the sort of the level of your programming? No, we're, we're, we're available to do that. We, you know, like we go in our area, we, um, see clients in, um, Barry at Spalding High School at uh, Williamstown. Um, you know, schools differ on whether and how much they want other people in. And also sometimes it's an issue of space. Like if we're actually going to do counseling practices, um, counseling sessions there. So we're happy to go if um, if it works for the schools and they can you know provide a place for us to do that. And then, you know, we also we also do some are, you know, are available to do some presentations and trainings. Um, it, it, you know, it's, um, we're available to do it. It's, it's, it, it often is a question of being asked and invited. Yeah. So. Does it come down to like the school nurse or somebody or the health specialist at the school to make these invitations or to seek outside support? Will, do you know? I've hooked into the health classes so i think health yeah. is health class health teachers that that's a good avenue um yeah. there's also at harwood as well as spalding there's also a group um called ovx which stands for our voices exposed and so that's a great group and so it's a coordinated effort with teens and so there's like a coordinator there's an ovx coordinator in these places yeah. Uh, Harwood has one, Spalding has one. Um, and so you could, that's a good avenue in as well, because those folks are, are working with um, mainly tobacco, uh, but th those folks, that's a great avenue in. So, so I mean, I appreciate these comments from the audience because I think as we get out of COVID, um, I think we may, as a coalition, may have opportunities to work with um, an annual meeting of all the health allied nurses or whatever those people are in the county because I think they do get together on, a, on some basis if not annual I think Anne has met with them um, Alice I see you've got a hand raised still sorry that's okay I just did it. I just raised it um, I do have a question for Will and Anne um, if you have a sense of it can you just um, explain if you've seen a difference in the rates of vaping in the um, middle schools and high schools pre and um, the the exiting of the, us uh, exiting the pandemic pre pandemic and now yes so it was a problem um, before covid i mean when it when when vaping first uh, started, it was out of control and a lot of kids did not realize there was nicotine in there and parents didn't either. We did a lot of education at that time. But right now across the board, we're connected with all the um, uh, coalitions throughout the state of Vermont and everyone is sort of in, in this panic that vaping is a real problem in many, many of the schools. So I would say, yes, it it, it has increased um, now. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it is a problem. And so I think that's where some schools are trying to work with um, getting trained in restorative justice and also in programs to help kids quit. Um, 802 quits, it, you know, is good for adults, but they also have um, uh, some texting and apps and ways for youth to stop uh, vaping too. 
Um, and yeah, you know, I think it really comes down to the school consequences, the sports teams, everybody really um, being on the same page and holding kids accountable for uh, their behavior and the violations. But I also want to say that we have funding, the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition and New Directions, we have funding to support schools in um, a universal screening. So this could be set up for um, Har Cross at Brook or for Harwood, you know, maybe early in the fall, that all kids would get screened for their mental health and their vaping use or their alcohol use. And we can, you know, then the counselors would really be able to see how many kids are really at risk and is everybody getting the treatment they need. And there's, there's this um, youth um, screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment survey that kids do, which is very informative so that they get information while they're taking it. It's different than the youth risk behavior survey. And so I think we'd like to talk to the school board about, um, you know, or the administration about getting that so that maybe there could be a wraparound um, plan of better school policies and the screening and more education to all the coaches and um, maybe a parent group. Yeah, Bert, I'm, I just wanna mention, Alice, that that was a little bit anecdotal that we hear that vaping has gotten worse post pandemic. The YRBF survey is done every two years. And so we don't have results yet of the next iteration, but that will be coming sometime. Right, yes. The data we shared was 2019. The survey has been taken in 2021. And then Vermont Department of Health um, needs time to process it, um, I think, in coordination with the CDC. And then we'll get the more, most updated information. So there's a significant lag time, and we use that data over a couple of years to be making decisions. The difference with the Y expert that Anna's talking about is that that's real time. It's not anonymous, and a student could be flagged um, if they, were, if they had high risky behavior and a counselor would be able to say, are you okay, what do you need? Um, you know, depending on how a school functions and what's available. Um, so those are the differences between those two um, programs. And Bert, let me come to you. Yeah, just two things. One thing it's really important to recognize about vaping is it's actually allowing nicotine to be an emotional management tool for young people in a very different way. Um, you know, cigarettes had a lot of limitations on, especially for young people, about how often you could do it. Or vaping, um, because it's so easy to do, and uh, in terms of it's not, it doesn't smell, it's not creating smoke, all these things. Uh, one of the, some of the stuff we see is kids using it just, you know, nicotine doesn't have a long term, doesn't have, doesn't, the effects of it are short term, you know, very, pretty short. You get a lot of cravings to use it. And in this form, it's easier for kids to use it throughout the day to kind of regulate, you know, their, you know, regulate low moods and other things. So it's really, that's just a really important aspect of how this changes the way nicotine is being used. Um, and I just also, you know, just another thing that's really important to know, like a big, a big aspect of what we do when we're doing substance use counseling for young people is really talking to them about um, giving them guides on, on how to handle their um, emotional and cognitive life. Because in addition to all these other risk factors, which are, you know, significant that have been discussed, um, uh, it's one of the real hazards of substance use. It's both a risk factor and a, an effect of early onset substance use that um, young people don't learn the skills for how they deal with their emotional world. And that is a critical skill. Um, and um, so uh, just to know that when, when people do end up going to treatment, that's a big part of what we look at with them and we try to talk to them about is um, you know, what's bothering them and what are some alternative ways of addressing it besides using substances? Thanks. Thanks, Bert. I know that we're just a little over time. Um, 
and we did lose some time to the Wi-Fi, but I'd like to sort of open it up to any last questions. I want to make sure that you're all heard from, and we talked quite a bit um, in the beginning. Yes, Kathleen. Yes, hi. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm actually a Worcester elementary parent, and I'm joining this forum because I wasn't aware of the previous one at the U32 school system. But it just, I've, I've enjoyed the presentation so far. Thank you. Um, but Bert just reminded me of something that I just read the other day and I was discussing with a teacher yesterday. And unfortunately, I, I don't know where I read that, this article this past week, but it had something to do with the Florida legislation and all the uh, review of education material that they were doing and across the nation. And it talked specifically about that social emotional learning and they were eliminating or working to eliminate a lot of that learning that has been put in. And they referenced the Harvard School of Education and how that has been implemented, I don't know, however, across however many last years within our textbooks, you know, even with math, math equations was the example that the article used. I think it was in the Washington Post that I was reading. Yeah. And they were talking about how social emotional learning, even at the elementary level, is embedded right now in our textbooks um, or our worksheets. And they, they were even referencing some math equations, but there's an effort nationwide to take those pieces out. So I know that gets a little political, but it goes to what Bert was just referencing. And it's alarming to me. So I just wanted to bring that up or share. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. I also read that article and was dumbfounded. Um, and <laughs> Uh, it's definitely disturbing. I don't think that you would find anyone on this panel who considers that to be a political issue that's contentious, that social emotional learning is important um, for students. Um, but uh, anyone want to respond to that? Well, Mark? I read the same article and I was thinking about the fact that one of the arguments is that this really all belongs at home. <clears throat> this needs to be at home. You don't, shouldn't be getting this at school. It should be happening at home with your parents. And it just struck me how woefully unprepared so many parents are to really deal with the psychological, the cognitive, and then all the social pressures raising a child in the 21st century. It's tough. And, um, you know, I think you need a community to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you take away some part of the community, then you're really left with a lot of uh, support systems that are weak. Yeah, I mean, I'll just echo that. I mean, I have one child, a six-year-old, and I struggle enough myself. Seven. Oh, excuse me. He just corrected me. He's seven now. <laughs> oh, look at that. It's live here. Yeah, nice. He's in the background. But um, anyway, I don't know why I said six. I think I was talking with first grade. I was talking to a first grade, and, and my child is an older first grader. He's a seven, but he's a first grader, and I think that's a mix-up. Oh, like. we, we understand. <laughs> you know how it is. It's important anyway, at that age, yeah. Um, I, I did, I just, I, um, now I don't even remember what I was saying. Oh, that, that, you know, that I do struggle social, emotional teaching here, you know? And so it, it, it's, it's nice that for me that it's embedded in our math equations. But anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to echo what you said. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Bert, did you want to respond to any of that? No, I mean, I, it, well, no, and now here I am talking. Um, <laughs> so I guess, yes. I mean, um, yeah, obviously, there's a lot of stuff, you know, in terms of what's going on in the country right now, which is, you know, what it is. I think, I think, I think it's really important when we're talking about substance use specifically to um, help more people understand this, these connections. That you know, at its heart, you know, for all the different reasons that that people might get exposed to them or things that that can help and be protective factors, at its heart. What substances do is they give you a certain 
apparent control over what your internal experience is like. And for young people, you know, they don't understand the price that they pay for that. You know, they just are looking at the short term and it can be effective in the short term, but there's a high price to be paid for that on a number of fronts. And so I think part of the thing is, is I think is the importance of educating not just young people, but parents to how vital these skills are to um, uh, kind of uh, making young people more resistant to developing substance use issues as adolescents or later in life. And um, so I think that's that's some of the work to be done. And it's um, obviously there's a lot of work to be done around that area. So thanks, Bert. So I, um, I have to say that unfortunately, uh, the building is closing soon. <laughs> so we got to wrap it up. So I want to thank everyone so much for, for listening, for participating, for sharing today. Uh, you know, ultimately, we really feel like starting conversations is so important, and that's exactly what we're doing here tonight. We encourage the conversation to continue in your own lives, with your families, with us. Please reach out to us. Um, if you have an idea, we have so many people at the table that are willing to step up and help make it happen. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We would like uh, to launch one more poll. It's the two question poll. It's very quick and easy. Same questions. Um, and you have it as well on paper. It's the post survey. So again, if someone I know is struggling with drug or alcohol use, I would know what resources to point them to for help is the first question. Um, and then the second question is, there are actions I can take to make my community a healthier place for young people? Um, Alice, uh, and for everyone here, this is our last uh, community forum of this sort of season. We decided to halt them over the summer, um, but we will be picking them back up in the fall um, to touch some of the towns that we haven't been to yet. That would include sort of the Twinfield area, um, Berry City, um, and some other places. Um, so we will be back up and running in the fall and back in touch with you if you'd like to attend them. Um, poll good, Olivia? Yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to close that poll. I just want to, again, thank everyone so much for being here. If you're in the room, again, please take some pizza. Um, on Zoom, thank you all for bearing with us through the technical issues. We really look forward to continuing these conversations. Thank you.